having uh, six speakers, uh, Michael Kien, James, James Russell, Helen Roy, Janif, uh, David Ringel, and myself. So thank you for coming, and we start with uh, Michael's presentation. Yeah, I'd like to welcome um, Michael Keen. Michael Keen is the director of the Botanical Garden of the University of Vienna in Austria. Michael, you've got 15 minutes plus five minutes questions. So, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for giving me the floor to present something which normally should be presented by someone else, by Alan Tai, whom probably most of you might know. Alan had been working in this part of the world for quite a while, but unfortunately had to go back home and he didn't get the funds to get here. And so it is my task to present as one of the contributors to these uh, new uh, IUCN guidelines for invasive species planning and management on islands to give that presentation to you. And I hope that the slides are now coming. Um, so, I probably uh, start without my presentation. Ah, <laughs> um, oh, here we are. Um, these new guidelines have been published last year in English, and they have also, meanwhile, been published in French and in Spanish, and I will give the uh, addresses for downloading them at the end, at the last slide again, so that can, you can write them down. Actually, the guidelines are designed to assist anyone planning and programming invasive species management on island. And the intention is, of course, to uh, reduce the negative impacts, but it's also a hands-on uh, guidelines, and they should provide a comprehensive framework for management. They should address all problems, areas, and facilitate prioritization they should increase action and improve implementation. Also, efficiency and cooperation, networking, should be uh, increased and duplication, unnecessary duplication and uh, unnecessary loss of funds should be reduced. It should be guiding the work both on the international and on the national region by agencies and donors. It should guide the development of programs on countries and islands, including national invasive species strategies and action plans, and it should also aid in, uh, help individual agencies to plan their strategies. And finally, it should also help to guide uh, strategic and local fundraising. The guidelines are composed of two major sections. The first section is a checklist section this includes the essential compounds of a comprehensive and effective invasive species management program. There are 10 thematic areas I'm going to present shortly uh, soon, and they are grouped into three overall themes, foundations, information, and prioritization, and management actions. All these thematic areas need, according to the author's view, to be considered when planning an invasive species program for an island or for several islands. After these foundations, there will be a how-to section, and that's a real hands-on section, which will provide supplementary guidelines for the planning and implementation process, how to engage, how to build momentum, how to get support, how to make decisions, Prioritization will be a topic and also translation of the plans into action. And the guidelines are designed in a way that they can be used at each possible level from the local to the national or the regional level. Well, the 10 thematic areas, as I said, are grouped around three topics. One is foundation and you see that there are four parts in foundation, planning and decision making, generating support, building capacity, and legislation, policy, and protocols. The second part, information and prioritization, 
shows baseline and monitor, uh, monitoring change, prioritization and research on priorities. And the management actions, the third part, has three uh, themes. That's biosecurity, management of established invasives, and post-management restoration. So all these topics you will find in the guidelines. The guidelines have roughly 55 pages, so it's not a large document. To give you an example for the uh, checklist, I've uh, taken out planning and decision making, and there you have several aims. For these aims, you have different objectives, and you have actions which are directly related to the actions, which means that you have a kind of shopping list which you can look at and directly adjust to the questions and needs that you have in your uh, concrete, in your uh, situation. And in the uh, foundation section, you have 16 such objectives, and you have 67 actions in that part eight, which means you should really find a good best practice example or a good explanation for each situation you encounter. For information and prioritization, I've again chosen one aim, baseline and monitoring change, and again, one aim, uh, sorry, on one topic and one aim out of it, and um, again, objective, actions. So this is the structure of this uh, guidelines part. You have five objectives here, 19 actions in part B. And in the part C, management actions, same structure again. And I don't expect you to read that because you can got, get all this online, which is, makes life much easier. But you have seven objectives and 29 uh, actions described in this part C. So these are, I would say, more or less the theoretical parts. And as I said already, not every country, not every agency, not every actor needs to done, do everything. But you select what suited to your needs. And there's no prioritization of the objectives because the priorities and the needs differ depending on the circumstances. And so you can select the priorities according to your needs. And prioritization is facilitated because when you have the different objectives, aims, and potential uh, activities at hand, you can see what's probably the easiest things to do or the most urgent things to do in your context. And one aim is that those, uh, doc this document try to be as comprehensive as possible so that it helps to ensure that key aspect relevant to any given situation or program is not going to be forgotten. Now, let's come to the how-to section, which again has three parts. It's engage, build momentum and support, then write the plan, prioritize and make decisions, and finally, translate the plan into action. And in the how-to section, in the momentum part, you get, for instance, examples of how networks can be established. I had many more slides initially, and then I realized I only have 20 minutes and not two hours, and uh, so I've just taken out the one example for establishing a network, just describing what a successful network looks like. And you have best practice examples for all of these cases from different island groups, depending on the islands, you might have different approaches, there will be shown, and so again, you can see where do you fit in already, or what can you do in your uh, situation. Prioritization is a big problem, especially when taking the financial and work power constraints into account. So, prioritization is described, for instance, also in prioritizing areas of action, prioritizing species, pathways, and sites, but also not only from a scientific point of view, but from a management point of view. And we've heard about the different uh, ways uh, invasives can be established, 
And one example is, uh, for instance, that well-known um, series of actions that precaution, eradication, and um, well, containment up to mitigation um, can be an option in a given situation and it is described which actions are probably possible and where a certain uh, action might be most suitable for. Another question is, for instance, when it being in contact with uh, economic uh, organizations and the question whether or not to commercialize a certain species, um, giving data at hand to make sure that if you talk to a non-biologist, they understand why or why not a given species could probably be commercialized or better probably would not be commercialized. When it comes to writing a plan, prioritize and make decisions, uh, again, there are hands-on uh, proposals. Um, one of the problems is we have too many tasks and we have too little manpower, we have too little money. So a straight, really strong com recommendation is to focus and not to just uh, try to do everything. And there's a lot of lack of information and that always hampers to get started. It's a clear recommendation. Well, try to get as much information as you can, but get started if you have a clear target. And also, don't do just something, because then you might run in troubles in rectifying what you are doing. Try to be as comprehensive as possible also in the argumentation why and what you are exactly doing. And if you're writing up uh, a species uh, action plan for invasives, Again, it's very nicely described how that can be done in practice, and I've just taken out the principles here, that you consider all ten thematic areas, that you are inclusive, that you include key sectors, that you link to national biology plans if they are existing, or developmental strategies, and that you plan for the future uh, so that you give perspectives at the end. So that's what decision makers always like to see. And there's a template for you to prepare such a plan, uh, which you can just follow. Finally, uh, translating the plan into action, there is a very nice project cycle, which comes from a publication uh, which has recently appeared. And you start with the project, and you end in, prin in principle with a perspective for the next project. And uh, these are kinds of diagrams which you can use to transfer your ideas to decision makers which are not coming from the bi biological field because they do understand such kinds of graphics much better than just giving a figure of native versus non-native species. And the different themes, the different ten themes were looked at uh, in existing plans and some of them are very well covered in existing plans. Some others aren't. And as I said, it's important to be comp comprehensive and to consider all 10 thematic themes. And that might help you also to look into what's probably been forgotten. And commonly neglected areas are, for instance, aspects in restoration, which normally should be addressed in some regard, because if you're able to just mitigate the influence of a non-native non invasive, it should also include some benefits for the native species. In order to back what you have to deliver and what you have to explain, there are at the end three pages of resources. On one hand, global instruments, and on the second hand, regional strategies and instruments so that you again can find what has been done elsewhere in the world. And that probably allows you, besides writing your own uh, invasive species management and action plan, to uh, link up and network with other 
uh, islands, other regions uh, which have similar problems and which might or perhaps have gone one or two steps further than you are in your actual situation. Well, I've had to keep to my time. I hope I did that. And as I promised, here are the uh, three links in English, Spanish, and French. And I thank you very much for your attention. And I thank Alan Tai and all the contributors to, I would like to thank them for having pro uh, provided that fantastic guidelines book. Thank you. We've got time for questions. This is a symposium. <laughs> the, the interest of symposia is that uh, we have a, a discussion of what we, we are presenting. So don't, don't hesitate. Don't be shy. Ask, ask questions. Any questions? Yes. Um, thank you for this great talk, um, Bernd Lenzner from Vienna University. I was wondering if the IUCN plans something on tracking the success or these uh, action plans for maybe subsequent meta-analyses or things to assess on which ways forward work on which kind of island types or to, to get an idea on, on how the guidelines are adopted and how effective they are. Well, as far as I know, the uh, specialist group uh, is uh, observing that, but as far as I know, there has not been any funds allocated to do that on a, let's say, scientifically based uh, general overview. But I think it might be a very good idea to look into uh, the ways these guidelines are now uh, well used for, for actions. We've got time, another question. Michael, in your opinion, do you think that these guidelines can be applied to many islands that belong to undeveloped, undeveloped uh, countries? Uh, I very strongly, uh, co um, I'm very sure that the uh, guidelines are designed especially uh, for areas and countries where there is very little uh, manpower or financial support available, mainly because there is a very strong emphasis on networking. Uh, it is quite clear that not every small island or every uh, region can do everything. And I think the, one of the key issues, and this is emphasized very strongly in the guidelines, is that very much can be achieved through networking. And we have best practice examples for that in, the, um, in some parts of the world. They are also explained and also explained how uh, the individual um, islands are benefiting from these ways of networking. And the networks are operating differently, but they all have achievements. And as I said, you can't do everything, but you have to start somewhere. And the guidelines also give a very clear uh, indication, well, you have to decide, but then you can get started. Last question, the lady. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, is there time to give us a little example of a, ne a network uh, uh, example that you were going to discuss? Mm -hmm. Well, there are uh, in the uh, guidelines, for instance, there is the uh, Pacific Island Network mentioned where uh, several, uh, several islands in the Pacific region have set up, uh, for instance, an early warning system for uh, potential invasives to come and uh, where there have been also uh, joint management actions proposed 
And um, this can be done even without physically meeting. Uh, these days with uh, internet, uh, it's quite easy, pos easily possible to link up, but the first uh, precondition is that people who are involved in such actions, not only the scientists, but also decision makers, politicians, get involved in that network. And that, for instance, has happened in the Pacific. It has happened in the Caribbean region to some extent. Uh, it happens in the, um, uh, well, as far as I know, in the European Union as well. Uh, so, um, at different levels, uh, these networks already are operative. The guidelines try to improve the um, eff efficiency of, of uh, already existing networks as well. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Let's a little thank you for Michael. <laughs> our, our next speaker is James Russell. James Russell is from the University of Auckland in New Zealand, coming from the uh, beautiful region of the South Pacific. Kia ora, James. Kia ora. Kia ora tato, everyone. Um, about 18 months ago, annual reviews invited me uh, to write uh, a review on the topic of island biodiversity in the Anthropocene. And uh, it was a really fun challenge, and I reached out to Christoph Koifer because of his complementary skills in, in plant biology and some of his different takes on some of these. In fact, it's been pointed out. We seem an interesting pairing to, to write a review on this topic, but um, we, we enjoyed debating and changing some of our worldviews on invasive species and, and novel ecosystems, for example, with one another. Uh, when putting this, these slides together, I actually was going through my, my photos to find a nice little island to be a, a banner here. And uh, I just realized yesterday that actually this island is Leeward Island off the coast of Antipodes Island in the New Zealand subantarctic. And uh, until a few years ago, it had uh, literally never been touched by humans. As we undertook mouse eradication on the nearby main island, we had a helicopter in this group for the first time in history. And we had to, had to land a, a helicopter on that island just to check that by some rare chance a, a skua bird hadn't taken a, a mouse and dropped it alive on this island and it had invaded. So uh, there are still islands in the world that have never been touched by humans in, in any way. So just an outline for what I'm going to talk about today from this review paper. The, the first thing Christoph and I asked ourselves is, well, what kind of working definition of the Anthropocene are we going to, to use? And then I'm going to talk about the next question, which was, well, what actually is island biodiversity in the context that we want to consider it? And we realized that we really couldn't talk about island biodiversity today if we didn't consider island biodiversity and its formation before humans impacted islands. So I'll speak about that. I'll then take you through our, our different categorizations of human impact on islands through first contact to what we called modern history since 1500 through to the contemporary era today in the 21st century. And then I'll get to some exciting new data we compiled um, from, from other studies and synthesized in a new way on some of the drivers, the current threats to island biodiversity and the emerging patterns. And then I'll finish by some of Christoph and I's ideas on protection and restoration um, and cultural landscapes and, and novel ecosystems and how really islands can adapt to the future. So some, some damning statistics that we'll all be familiar with. 78% uh, of the plant, planet's surface is today considered anthropogenic biomes. And it's been predicted that up to 58% of, of vertebrate species might go extinct in the 21st century. So it's certainly clear to all of us here uh, that the scale of the effects of humans on physical, chemical, and biological processes have, have led scientists to introduce this concept of, of the Anthropocene, which has still not been formally adopted by, um, by the geological societies, but they're moving towards that. Um, there is still uh, some debate about when it officially started. Some people like to go back to the Industrial Revolution, if not earlier. Some people think just the 21st century. But the general agreement is, is that post-World War II period, um, most commonly the mid-20th century, particularly the advent of, of nuclear weaponry and the radiation marks that that has left in our atmosphere. Uh, 
Um, and then we also just wanted to, to clarify what type of islands we'd be working on. So we focused on islands surrounded by water and more specifically those in, in oceans and seas. We didn't want to re refer to them as oceanic islands because that re uh, it refers specifically to those volcanic islands that have never been connected to, the, to any continent. So in a broad sense we just refer to these as marine islands but we're not considering freshwater islands or, or other habitat type islands that sometimes get invoked in, in consideration of island biodiversity. So to that end, the Global Island Database identifies 175,000 islands greater than uh, 0.1 of a kilometre squared, and uh, just short of 18,000 of those are larger than one kilometre squared. And as we know, they make up five, just over 5% of the planet's land area. One quarter of the world's countries are islands or archipelagos, and more than two-thirds of the planet's countries include islands in some form or another. And, and just considering data compiled from small island developing states, islands are home to at least 50 million people. So a large number of people are interacting with islands on a daily basis as part of their livelihoods. We really wanted to break down biodiversity because this has downstream ramifications for when we talk about um, different threats and their impacts and particularly around introduced species following on from the, the plenary that Tim Blackburn gave when we look at alien species richness. And, and we wanted to emphasize that species is a really important part of biodiversity. You can see it there that when we talk about species, there is um, at the bottom there just the pure species richness element and, and particularly the unique endemic island elements and we can decompose that to estimates of alpha, beta and gamma diversity. But also when we're considering the species on islands or in biodiversity in general, we have to consider the abundances of those species where we see such things as density compensation on islands. We have to consider the uniqueness um, the phylogenetic uniqueness of those species where we might see uh, radiations and, and living fossils occurring more often on islands. Even prior to that, genetics is a really important component of that and we've already seen some good talks about that at the conference so far where we can look at ways of, of measuring genetic variation at the individual level, at the subpopulation level and in the total population level across archipelagos. And there, there are lots of good genetic tools and methods to do that. Um, one suite of statistics that's quite powerful is just the F statistics that are used. But even then, when we're considering biodiversity, it's just got so many components when we're trying to metricize it. And so other ways to look at it might be interactions and, uh, and how unique those are on islands and, and the pairings and couplings of those. And uh, my colleague, uh, Christopher Kaiser Bumber, will be giving a talk about networks on islands later on on Thursday in the Seabird session. And then we're starting to see some emerging work around island syndromes. There's been some good work on that on plants, but um, Casey Burns has just published a great book with Cambridge University Press on plant syndromes, uh, uh, island syndromes in plants. So, and, and it's also been described in reptiles as well. So another important component of biodiversity. And finally, we have to look at the role habitat diversity plays in, in driving um, biological diversity. So those components include whether you're on a volcanic island, uh, such as the Hawaiian archipelago that Rosie Gillespie's talking about and done so much work on, um, the atolls around the world, or even those continental islands off adjacent coastlines. I don't want to dwell on um, island biodiversity uh, formation before humans, because it's well known to all of us as, uh, from our undergraduate studies. Um, although these stages don't necessarily occur consecutively in this order, we see classical things such as historical contingency creating unique circumstances, um, community assembly occurring through things such as taxon cycles and assembly rules, and eventually evolution on islands through processes such as anagenesis and cladogenesis. So uh, we have an illustration in, in the paper which just shows how sometimes species aren't even able to disperse to islands from a nearby continent. Sometimes uh, they can disperse. Um, but uh, they're not able to establish. Some of them can establish, but then bad luck, that volcano or that storm um, may have an impact on you. Um, even then, the, the assembly processes can kick in and you might not be a winner in those sweepstakes. Or, uh, or finally, you might push through and, and, and encounter some form of evolution to create speciation and diversification and, and island biodiversity. So those were all the standard processes we know were occurring before humans arrived. But then we had first contact. Um, which uh, the dates of that vary greatly across islands around the world, so we, we don't put a particular date on that, but we note that when humans on islands arrived, they typically ate their way down trophic levels, starting at the megafauna and working their way down. Insular species were more vulnerable than continental ones because of the, those island syndromes and, and the lack of refugia on small islands by simply being a smaller land area, there were fewer places for species to hide. We know from the Pacific um, that 20% of the avifauna, or at least 1,000 species, went extinct following first contact. 
Following that, though, the modern era does have a reasonably clear date of about 1500, corresponding with the age of discovery when Europeans spread out from Europe. So in modern history, we know European culture came to dominate much of the world due to the, that extensive overseas exploration and, and the rediscovery of remote islands um, that already had indigenous people. Whereas during the initial indigenous people phases, they tended to be primary economies just based on um, extracting resources for local use. The economy shifted now to exploiting the natural resources, but more towards a secondary economy, focusing on manufactured goods which could be exported back to continental homelands. Uh, during this period, since 1500, 90% of bird extinctions that have occurred in the world have been on islands. And, uh, and we also saw that population size and cultural diversity of indigenous people also declined dramatically at the same time as biodiversity began to decline. So in the contemporary era today, uh, with rapid international transit, um, globalization, and the diversity of vectors and pathways for introducing new species and diseases have all increased, and we're seeing the types of introduced species changing. The historical biogeographic barriers that delineated the world, in particular islands from continents, have broken down. Um, we're seeing diversification to tertiary economies towards tourism and uh, diminishment of colonial Western European powers promoting independence for many islands. So we compiled two data sets. We had Maxwell et al. and Nature published uh, a summary of all threats to IUCN red-listed species in total, whether they be on continents or islands, and um, not long after that, Leclerc et al. published uh, a list just for species on islands. And so what we found was that uh, of the 8,000 or so IUCN red-listed threatened species, half of those, just over 4,000, occurred wholly on islands. So for threatened species on the IUCN red list, half of them are on islands. So that's kind of our baseline, baseline here. And what I want you to see is that for any given threat, um, we see that for, say, over-exploitation, if you're a, one of the 6,000 species that suffers from exploitation, only 2,000 of them, or 38%, are found on islands. So less than you'd expect from the expectation. What jumps out here is that, in fact, the only threat that is more prevalent on islands for island species than continental species is invasions and disease, where if you're a species on the IUCN red list vulnerable to invasion and disease, you're much more likely to also be on an island. But I would note here, although it's the higher percentage, on islands themselves, more species are still vulnerable to over-exploitation and agricultural activity. So the takeaway message here is that although invasions and disease have caused the most extinctions in the past, and, uh, and we think kind of are able to deliver the coup de grace of making species go extinct through the way predators in particular can hunt out the very last individuals, over-exploitation and agricultural are still the major threat to species on islands. But disproportionately, invasive species are more likely to impact island species. Um, we tackled the species richness, I won't spend too much time on this, but we really wanted to get to the bottom of this idea that um, it's not just about species richness alone, because we end up in these, these kind of spurious debates about whether introduced species are improving species diversity or, or declining it in species richness, and it's really a question of, of scale. But we see here an example where we have an atoll, uh, an archipelago with 26 native species. You introduce five species, um, and it's the same five species turn up in different numbers to different islands. Uh, you lose five unique species that were island endemics. So at the end of the day, you might say, well, you started with 26 species in the archipelago and you finished with 26 species, so species richness has stayed the same and, and nothing bad has come of these introductions. But in reality, you've lost five island endemics and this, um, this calculation of gamma diversity is really scale dependent because then if we extrapolate it globally, um, we've lost five species from the world, but those five introduced species were already found in other places of the world. So once again, that, that clear story of the homogeneity of, uh, of the world's fauna and flora through introductions of species. So we finally finish by talking about adaptation, and we link back to those four islands because they each provide a different example. Islands, um, one there is a good example of protection where you have undisturbed natural habitat which, uh, which remains only in small pockets, but you can protect that and, and undertake conservation, whereas on island four, it might be a good candidate for restoration, uh, which has been particularly prevalent on small uninhabited offshore islands where we can do eradications, replantings, and reintroductions of species. Island 2 might be a novel ecosystem landscape, where as a result of former land use, um, novel ecosystems have developed, mixed species compositions of native and non-native species occurring together, um, and we do really emphasize here that decisions around management of novel ecosystems include a really strong values component where there's a lot of ongoing debate I think a lot of us are aware of. Another example would have been Island 3 in that previous slide, which was a cultural landscape. 
native biodiversity persists across it, but it's an island uh, landscape that's used by humans uh, as part of their livelihoods. So subtle changes in management and behaviour here can, can promote biodiversity in these landscapes, but we have to build on local knowledge, culture and sovereignty to really enable this on islands. Uh, we also summarise protected areas on islands, and we've got some really good data out of the, the protected planet um, data on protected areas around the world. So we see that on average, 23.5% of uh, the world's islands are in some form of protected area status, uh, although that doesn't necessarily mean that that protected status is effective um, in management. But um, that's a really good statistic, I think, that 23.5% of the world's islands are in protected area status. And we can see some clear trends. Those first six islands there are all uninhabited islands. And um, another bias we see is the brown islands are... are um, island nations, territories or dependencies owned by continents, whereas the blue islands are all our small island developing states. So we see a bit of a bias um, that the small island developing states are a bit under-prescribed for protective areas. The other point I'd just make is the number of protected areas alone isn't necessarily a good um, correlate. You can have very high numbers of protected areas, um, but then be below the average. So it's uh, whether these are small protected areas and there's lots of them, or large protected areas in, in smaller numbers. But um, some statistics there for all the island groups around the world. So in conclusion, um, a couple of slides of conclusions because there's some management to follow. Um, islands can serve as model systems for biodiversity, conservation in the Anthropocene and they teach the importance of holistic approaches. Biodiversity takes many forms and it is far more than species richness alone. The biogeographic boundaries of islands have been removed by globalisation and, and we've also seen a resurgence of indigeneity and a return to independence, especially for small island developing states. Invasive species have been the major driver of extinctions and of current threat status uh, on islands disproportionately. When we talk about management, we think although the impacts of biological invasions have consistently been the major threat on island ecological communities, emerging threats such as human-induced climate change will become more pronounced, although today, as the major threat to IUCN red-listed species, they're still quite small. A protection and restoration of ever-diminishing natural areas will remain critical, but biodiversity can also be enhanced in cultural landscapes that combine natural and human values and activities. And on many islands, novel ecosystems of mixed native and non-native species will need to be accepted and managed in perpetuity. So I just want to leave you with our, our summary conclusion from the paper, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, James. It's working? Oh. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. And we have a couple of minutes for questions. I think there is one very, uh, two very different kinds of situations when we, where you had a long uh, history of indigenous people in islands changing gradually and adapting to the environment. And then we have, uh, for instance, many islands where we have 500 years of history of human impact that was very rapid, uh, changing dramatically. What is your opinion uh, in how uh, we should manage or think in long term management of invasive species in these two kinds of situations? I think for those islands we can, we can just look at them through these three different lenses of are they, are they still what we consider pristine and native or I think for those islands that have a long human presence we're really moving into those cultural landscapes where it's um, it's uh, very difficult uh, even with, uh, it's, it's difficult to agree on what is native or even have the scientific tools using genetic or paleological methods to determine what was historically native. So we're really looking at managing the human nature relationship on those islands. And, uh, and then I think probably the novel ecosystem component then comes on more on, on some of these more recently colonized islands where we just have a clear mix of, of native and non-native um, habitats, but they're really merged together and, and they're really difficult to, to disentangle. So I think the framework there can work, but we just have to be, to be clear when we're, which of those types of 
habitats we're working on and, and really getting involved in the value discussions around those as much as the scientific evidence for what's native and what's non-native. <coughs> Thank you very much for a really fascinating talk. And um, your, f your final point about um, managing this human and um, biodiversity relationship going forward is incredibly ambitious. And I wondered if you have thoughts on what are the major knowledge gaps, because in some senses it's going to be a game to play, and we don't yet know all of the rules. So what are the major gaps in understanding that are going to allow us to play that game most effectively? I call myself a conservation biologist because I was, trained I was trained classically in biology and statistics, but as I move forward trying to achieve conservation aims, which um, for me, for the most part, is rat eradications on islands, I, re I realized most of the science gaps we had were social science. And, uh, and so very much I've moved myself into a social science space where there's some fascinating, fascinating social science and political science questions about, which we know well from climate change, why despite all of the, the technical, biological, chemical, physical evidence do we continue to persist in, in poor choices? And those are fascinating social science and political science questions. So I, I really urge all, all conservation biologists or biologists in general that want to see this meaningful change to either partner with um, really good, trustworthy, uh, social scientists and political scientists you have good working relationships with or, or retrain yourself um, even though you have a particular tool set um, mine is mark recapture of rats on islands it's not useful for a lot of the, the gains we want to make on rat eradication um, on inhabited islands for example and, and we're very lucky in New Zealand um, that we, we've really moved forward with our relationship with the indigenous people as, as a legacy of the treaty we signed and that's um, a really challenging issue because you have to work over a lot of social injustice that's occurred. And, and the indigenous people quite often tie the environmental injustice with the social injustice together. And if you work towards um, restoring uh, restorative justice on the social issues, you can decouple the environmental and the social justice issues and, and make progress for the environment. So uh, we don't have more time for questions, but maybe at the end we can uh talk with the speakers. So it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. She's Helen Roy from the Center of Ecology and Hydrology in the UK. Thanks, Helen. Well, first and foremost, thank you so much to the organizers of this symposium. It's a real pleasure um, to be here and indeed thank you to the conference organizers. What a wonderful place. Um, to be. And I'm going to be talking about many, many wonderful places that um, I have had the pleasure um, to visit some of when my slides come up and you'll be able to share the beautiful photos. <laughs> well, maybe while we're waiting, I can thank some of the people in the audience who have been a really large part of this project. Sir Lauren Mallins from St. Helena, Danielle um, Frolik from Hawaii, Peter Convey in the back there, who represents the British Antarctic Territory, and really um, my co-lead in this project, um, Jodie Payton from the Center for Ecology and Hydrology in the UK. So I'm going to be talking about some work that has involved about 147 participants, and we've been predicting um, which are the species that are most likely to arrive on some islands within the next 10 years and pose a threat to biodiversity, ecosystems, economies, and also human health. And we had one year over which to, to do this work, um, so it's been a really exciting whirlwind. And I think my talk will also be a bit of a whirlwind. Um, but if there are any sound bites that I give that you would like some more information on while well, I'm around, and I'd be really happy to chat. So I apologize if it is a bit of a flurry of ideas. Um, but please do come and speak with me over the next few days. So this was work funded by the UK government and um, led by the Non-Native Species Secretariat, which is a fantastic organization that we have um, within Britain that coordinates activity around um, invasive non-native species and strategy within um, Britain and also the UK overseas territories. So here are some of the many, many people that I have had um, the pleasure to work with. And of course, I can't name them all, 
but they've been absolutely <coughs> critical to this project. And going out to many regions, to the UK overseas territories, the people who live there, who work there, who have that depth of knowledge have been absolutely critical to the work that we have been doing. We would not have been able to do this project without that extreme knowledge. So thank you so much, and particularly, for instance, to Lawrence in the audience here, who you should definitely speak with. So we have been to some inspiring places and met some inspiring people. And I have an absolute passion for the natural world. And I thought maybe it couldn't grow. But actually going to some of these places, I have even more passion. But I think what's also has been great for me is I have even more hope because some of the stories that I've heard from people in these places has really shown me that there is some really amazing work that is going on um, to try and address some of the problems that we have been causing um, over many, many decades. So this is um, St. Helena, and the little slide in the corner is, um, has Lauren Mallins in the midst of it. And we visited his um, endemic plant nurseries where he works with a team of incredibly dedicated people to restore some of the habitats um, on St. Helena. It's an inspiring story, and I don't have long enough to share with you quite how um, taken I was with it, but do please um, chat with us over the next few days. I definitely want to go back here. Do invite me, Lawrence. <laughs> So, um, of course, um, we have recently heard about the IPBES um, Global Assessment. It's had a lot of media attention, and it's been the first study really to rank the um, drivers of biodiversity and ecosystem change, and invasive species come out within that top five. Globally, they are ranked as the fifth, but of course, as we've already heard, within islands, they have um, far um, greater importance. And I also want to take this opportunity to mention that it best, if you haven't already heard, has just begun the process of a global assessment for invasive species. And I'm really fortunate to be um, one of the three co-chairs for that process, alongside Annabelle Pachard from Chile and also Peter Sturt from Canada. And I'm extremely excited about the next three and a half years. And if you'd like to know more about that, please chat to me because I'm sure you all have a part to play. So we've already seen this um, wonderful work from Hanno Siebens presented by Tim Blackburn. It was a fantastic talk, Tim. Thank you for that great introduction to um, alien species. And um, we're seeing this escalation and no sign of slowing in the accumulation. So we've done a lot of work between us in terms of documenting and looking at historic patterns and trends, but what about the future? What about going forward? And I think it's really important that we begin to um, grapple with making predictions about um, the future and the um, future projections around um, alien species arrivals. And, and that's not without its challenges, because another paper led by um, Hanno Siebens showed that many of the species that are cropping up have no previous invasion history. So how do we make predictions around species that have no previous invasion history? And we could have a whole symposium on that, um, but I think that's what we've got to begin to do. So we can see a lot of work that's been going on around modeling, for instance. So this is just some of the work that's been happening from the um, Center for Ecology and Hydrology. We've been working with European Commission funding and many, many collaborators um, to use um, making predictions, particularly including climate, um, so that we can embed this within risk assessments for various species. We're also beginning to look at um, creating scenarios so that we can begin to make some predictions and projections based around um, those scenarios. So there's exciting things happening um, in this field, and I have a project over the next year with our government department, DEFRA, um, to begin to use these scenarios um, to look at the particular projections for Britain. But that's all very well, but I think we need to do something now. And horizon scanning is a way in which we can begin to make some prioritization, at least. We can use a crude process to prioritize which species we think might arrive somewhere and cause some kind of problems. So it's a systematic examination of potential threats and opportunities within a given context. And we have developed this process, which we used back in 2012 to um, horizon scan for Britain, looking at the next 10 years, what are the species that are going to arrive and impact on biodiversity and ecosystems. It's a complicated diagram, but essentially it involves working with lots of experts to compile the best available evidence, to do some very crude ranking about the arrival, the establishment, and the impact those species might have, and then to begin to rank them 
dividing people first up into different groups so that they can focus on vertebrates, focus on plants, um, invertebrates, the marine environment, and then bring everyone together so that as a big expert group, we can begin to get a consensus over which species should we really give some priority. So we carried out this process for Britain and we published the paper in Global Change Biology. The process was in 2012. Over the years that have followed, we're about to repeat the whole process and really look in detail at how um, many of the species have arrived, for instance, maybe as a success indicator, maybe it's a failure indicator if we've made the prediction and then they've still arrived. Um, but actually, we have been quite successful with that British project in terms of quite a number of the species have now arrived. But what it has allowed us to do is to be prepared. And for example, one of the species that I will try and mention if I have time later on is the Asian hornet, Vespa velatina. We made the prediction it would arrive. We were extremely well prepared. And so far, we've been able to eradicate um, all occurrences of that species. We were then invited with European Commission funding to do the same process for the whole of the EU. That was extremely exciting. When we got given the money, I took a really deep breath because suddenly that's across many biogeographic zones, a very large area. We were considering all environments, all taxa other than pathogens. Um, but we did it. It was an exciting process. We shared lots of information, lots of knowledge. And indeed, that process has led to um, the annex for the EU regulation on invasive alien species because it's a way in which priority has been given to which species should be risk assessed so that if they meet the various um, criteria, they would then go on to um, be listed. So this process, this relatively crude process, has great potential in terms of implementing surveillance, monitoring, and also action. And that action can take a whole variety um, of different guises. So then, um, just over a year ago, or a bit more than that, I was really fortunate to be given funding by the UK government to carry out the same process for all of the 16 UK overseas territories. And this is a map of where um, those territories are distributed. So really a global distribution um, and a really exciting opportunity to put this method into practice and also to go and out and meet some quite incredible um, people. We had one year in which to cover all of those um, territories. Thankfully, some work led by Jody Payton meant that we had already um, carried out this exercise for the um, sovereign base areas in Cyprus. And um, also, we had made the first leap in this project to include human health. Prior to that, we had only considered biodiversity and ecosystems and their imp the impacts of the species on them. So with Darwin Initiative funding, we were able to carry out um, this process on um, the sovereign base areas of Cyprus, but also to extend to all, thank you, to extend um, across the entire Cyprus, and that paper is now published. So I just thought I'd show you some very quick pictures of some of the places we visited. So this is Grand Cayman, and I think it gives a fantastic example of an alien species causing lots of problems on an island. So underneath this car is a green iguana. The population currently is one million green iguanas on Grand Cayman. The population is doubling on an annual basis in a good year. In a bad year, it increases by 60%. That's just staggering. So having the opportunity to begin to make some predictions to try and prevent something like the green iguana arriving in the first place um, is, is really important. I've already mentioned um, St. Helena, but I can't show you enough photos, so here is another one. And um, this is Diego Garcia, the British Indian Ocean um, Territory. And this is a particular morning before a workshop began where we were out looking at the crabs exchanging their shells through the shell markets on the beach. I mean, it really has been an amazing privilege to undertake this project. So we carried out this process through lots and lots of workshops with lots of regional experts um, around the world. And um, these are the top invaders that came out of that process. We screened thousands and thousands and thousands of species, probably three, 4,000 species. We are just compiling the whole database from all of those different islands and um, overseas territories, and we will publish the data open as open access because I do think it probably has value for other places around the world um, because of the, the global spread of the, of the distribution of these species. So these are some of our um, top invaders. Um, the marine species are really quite concerning. Um, 
because of the impacts that they can have. And something like Perniviridis will have impacts on biodiversity ecosystems, but also human health and also economies. So some of these species span all the different impact categories and crop up, or have the potential to crop up in many, many different um, island um, groups. So we looked at the impacts across, this is just summarizing across all of the UK overseas territories, and actually the final report will be published very soon, and it's much more nuanced when you look at each individual territory rather than across the whole lot, but just in the interest of time, this is what I have time to do. So when we look at the numbers of species, we can see that in terms of biodiversity impacts, plants are really um, the big contenders, um, whereas much, they have, far less impact in terms of human health where it switches to the invertebrates where, for example, we have the disease vectors, for instance. We've also been looking at the pathways for making predictions about how these species might arise because that's where the action can be taken. If you can implement some pathway action plans to prevent the arrival in the first place, then this is where um, you can be really very effective. So we looked at all of the um, pathways using the CBD classification for um, pathways. So I won't go into all the detail, but they're all different pathways. You can see that um, some of them are more important than others. So for example, um, around the marine species arriving as stowaways and ships and ballast water, probably no surprises, but it did allow us to work with the regional experts to do some pathway action planning following on from um, these workshops. So we also got to meet, as I've said, some amazing people. So again, this is on St. Helena, and we had an afternoon um, with the biosecurity team. There had been a shipment of um, fruit just arriving, and we were able to just see what happens and how, how the amazing biosecurity um, takes place within these places to, to protect the um, environment by um, screening through these, um, pr this produce. So, it's going to be really important going forward to raise awareness around the problems of these, that these species can um, have, but also to improve monitoring in many of these different places, and also then to implement action and through management. And there's lots of fantastic good practice already. So at the top there is a poster on St. Helena for the Harlequin ladybird to raise awareness and to say, look out for Harmonia axillaris. If you see it, let us know. And this is what we've been doing for the Asian hornet in Britain, and it's been incredibly successful in terms of getting people involved in recording um, the early occurrence of some of these species. We've had the great talk already on um, the island's um, guidelines, so I won't go on any more about that from the IUCN, but it's fantastic to see um, this available. So I'm just going to finish by saying I do think it's time to think about pathogens. So we excluded pathogens and disease from this process because we just couldn't grapple with it. But having said that, in, for example, in the Antarctica, there's really some profound problems that could be caused by the arrival of some diseases. So I really think that it's about time that we started to think about alien pathogens and began to include those in our horizon scanning, but also in our alien species databases. There's lots of barriers um, to being able to do that and challenges, and we published a paper a few years ago in Conservation Letters to outline um, some of the barriers that we saw. But I think it's time that we just got over some of those barriers. So I want to thank you all for listening. It's been a bit of a whirlwind um, through that project. Um, to thank the UK government, but also the Non-Native Species Secretariat, to mention that I run a cost action called Alien Citizen Science Investigates, and I'd happily chat to you about um, that as well. But my particular thanks go to all of, of the many regional experts who took part um, in this project, and it would not have been possible without them. Thank you. Uh, really interesting talk. Thank you so much. I'm also from the UK, and I was just wondering um, if the UK does leave the EU, uh, then obviously our trade routes, our trade patterns will change. Do you have any idea as to whether that will have an impact on our vulnerability to invasive species? So specifically within the UK, I mean, of course, trade is extremely important in terms of um, invasion ecology and in terms of the way in which species arrive. So I guess it depends on how things play out in terms of um, you know, what we have in place um, 
to protect um, the UK from the arrival of non-native species. And certainly, for example, with um, plant health and animal health, we have um, some fantastic inspectorates. So it may be that we should increase the capacity around inspectorates um, for um, the UK if there are changes in trade patterns that suggest that we might be at more threat from alien species. So I certainly think it's an important aspect to consider and in terms of the projections through scenarios, then most definitely it's something that should be taken um, into account. So, yeah. Any but, other question? No, I was just gonna say, I think in terms of thinking about those changes in drivers, I mean, when we heard from James, his talk around um, it's so dynamic. All of these situations are very dynamic and very complex, and there are many different drivers that will change over time, climate becoming more important potentially as we go forward, and it probably already is, but we haven't studied it enough to, to, to see with the interactions with invasions. But certainly, if you think of some of the overseas territories, the changes that happen in terms of infrastructure, for instance, or trade, um, I actually think we've got a lot to learn from the overseas territories as well, from the UK, in terms of, for example, the surveillance and monitoring and inspectorates that they have in place. Um, so, yeah, I'm hopeful. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, what are some of the actions uh, that you use to increase uh, Asian hornet awareness in the UK? So the Asian Hornet awareness in the UK, oh, some yes. of the actions? Yes. Um, so as soon as we had our list of priority species from the horizon scanning, we invited, so one of the other important things about this horizon scanning is we often invite government officials and others to be part of the process. So they see it in action, they take the list away straight away with them before we publish or anything else so they can begin to think about what they're going to do because really it's about informing those decision makers. And so we're really fortunate in, in um, Britain to have the non-native species secretariat. So they took that away. The Asian hornet was seen as a species that there should be increased awareness around, for example, working with beekeepers. So this is a species that um, will feed on honeybees. And um, so increasing awareness of, with beekeepers, but also the general public. We very quickly launched an app for um, recording Vespa velatina, but also its relative, the European hornet, um, so that people could get involved. Gave lots of talks, radio interviews, wrote articles. Um, now, our problem actually is that we get, that graph was to show you, we get so many sightings of concern. And we've had less than 10 sightings of the Asian hornet, and everyone has been eradicated. Indeed, for example, on one Sunday, because we, we run it all over the weekend, the surveillance system as well, we had a sighting on a Sunday, it was eradicated on the Monday. But we have to pull out those 10 from thousands and thousands and thousands of records. I think just last month, we had 2,000 records coming through our systems. We have an email account, the online system, and also the app. Um, and it's incredibly um, intensive for people to have to check through those photos, to check through the text. So it's challenging. Um, and then the eradication is, I would say, quite simple because I don't have to do it. But people go out there and then just um, take out the nest. And all the hornets go back at night, so into the nest, so the whole nest can be taken out at night. Not so good for the hornet. One minute for one more question. No? Sounds good. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thanks, Thanks Helen. It's also... <laughs> it's also my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Janif Meyer, from the Department of Research at the Government of French Polynesia. Thank you, Marta. Hi again. My talk today will be about connecting people and, and territories, sometimes very distant. Uh, it took me 35 hours of, of flight to, to, to go from my home country of Tahiti and reach uh, La Réunion. I'm, I'm deeply convinced that the human dimension is, that people are, are crucial components, essential for successful conservation biology uh, actions and invasive species management. So I'm, I'm, I'm like my, my good colleague James, I'm turning uh, from, from an ecologist, a conservation biologist, into a social scientist for, for that reason too. So this talk was prepared with three of my 
good and old colleagues, Johan Souberan, who is uh, working for the French uh, IUCN committee. He's based in, in Montpellier, south of France. With Christophe Lavergne, uh, who is working for the National uh, Botanical Conservatory of, of Mascarin here in La Réunion. And Christophe is, is somewhere in the room. And with César Delnat, who, who currently works at, for the National Forestry Office in Martinique, in the French Antilles. And we all belong to the same network. It's called the Initiative, well, in, in English, the Invasive uh, Exotic uh, Invasive Species Initiative in the French Overseas Territory. And, and this initiative um, is, is coordinated by, by Johan. So uh, as, a uh, as a reminder, but you, you all know that, that uh, islands are on the front line of the impacts of uh, globalization. So we were talking about global biotic homogenization um, uh, or biotic mixing, which is caused by the, the increase, of increase of the frequency and intensity of transportation of people and goods across, across the world. And I, as an example, I, in, in this table, uh, I, I show you the, the number of uh, alien plants in, in different island groups in, in, in the Pacific region. And today, the number of alien species, alien plant species, exceeds the number of, of native plants. Oops, sorry. This is the number of alien, this is the number of native vascular plants. And, and the number of established or naturalized alien plants is now equal to the number of native plants. And, and that's, that's this column. Another, another issue is that invasive species do not respect borders. And I, I, I give you here three, three famous examples. One is the giant African snail, which would tra travel from, from, from Africa to, to, to the Indian Ocean and then to, to the Pacific uh, Ocean in, in the 19th century. Or the famous example of Lantana camera, uh, f originating from South Central America and then dispersed by, by human uh, in, in both uh, Indian and the Pacific Oceans. But there are also more and more species uh, being dispersed, sometimes uh, accidentally. And this is a, a recent paper about the, the land planaria platydemus, which is um, uh, spreading in, into the Pacific and, and didn't reach uh, the, the mascarons, but I think it's just a question of time. There, there is a, a, a consensus among, among uh, scientists and, and managers of invasive species that Prevention and early detection are, 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 are the most cost-effective management strategies. But for that, you need to know uh, your target, your invasive species target. And, and that's why we are using risk, risk, risk assessment. The invasion history of species is very important. The other consensus is that we are, most of all, are working at a, at a local or, or regional scale. And, uh, and we need to, to, to try to upscale to, to, to a global level by, uh, in, by uh, improving communication between, uh, between region or between countries and territories and by improving collaboration. So there, there are some existing and, and, and efficient networks, especially in the Pacific. I don't have time to, to, to detail uh, the, the, the different networks in the Pacific Islands, which is a regional network. Uh, for re to remind you, uh, the Pacific Islands, it's 10,000 islands, 24 Pacific Island countries and territories, including 13 small island developing states. And there are two, two very well-known and very efficient uh, networks. One is the PII, the Pacific Invasive Initiatives. The other one is the Pacific Invasive Learning Network. But today I'm going to talk about the very French-French uh, initiative. It's the, the French overseas, it's the, um, well, initiative so it's exotic. Uh, I have uh, al almost the same maps than, than Ellen, but for the French overseas island territories. It's, it's too bad uh, the United Kingdom is, is leaving Europe, <laughs> but we'll see how, how we can collaborate together. So the French overseas island territories the tr uh, is, is composed of 11 tropical islands uh, located in three different oceans. Um, Wallis et Futuna, French Polynesia, and um, New Caledonia and the Pacific, and also the, the remote atoll, uh, uninhabited atoll of Clipperton. Saint Martin, Saint Barthélemy, Guadeloupe, Martinique in the Caribbean, in, in the Atlantic Oceans, and uh, in, in the Indian Oceans, La Réunion, Mayotte, and the Ile Pars, the, 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 
scattered islands. So today I'm not, I will not talk about French Guiana, uh, Saint Pierre Miquelon, uh, and, and the, the TAF. So vo those islands are found in five of the 36 global biodiversity hotspots. Uh, and it's interesting to, to, to note that um, among the 18,000 endemic plants and animals of France, 70% of them are found in those French overseas island territories. Um, unfortunately, uh, those territories, they harbor uh, half of the recognized uh, 100 world's worst invasive Indian species. And we, with my colleagues, we calculated that we have more than 300 invasive Indian plants in those, those territories, excluding the weeds and in, in agro-systems. Among them, well, among those species, you, you may recognize some of them. There was a, sorry, there was a recently published, uh, let's say, popular booklet published uh, this year showing that, that uh, metropolitan France, but also La Réunion, New Caledonia, are, are the, the, the territories with the highest number of invasive uh, marine and terrestrial uh, species. There, there's also something we, which is interesting is that uh, those territories found in, in three different islands, they, they share a common pool of invasive plants. And uh, this, this figure shows the number of invasive plants according to, the, to, to 10 uh, territories. 80% of them are found in only one, on one territory, but 20% but of them, 20 of them are found in two or three territories, which means that they are found, well, we share a kind of common pool of, of species. This is a, a list of those uh, uh, well, 30, 30 uh, most common uh, invasive plants which are found in, in more than two, two or three territories. You can recognize uh, Lucena is, is, Leucocephala is, is is found in, in most of them, et cetera, et cetera. Don't have time to detail. Some of them have, have huge impacts on, on the ecosystem structure, composition, and dynamics. Well, back, back to the initiative. I think that's the, my main point. So the initiative was created in 2000, 2005, so it's a, and it's still ongoing. So it's a 14 years old initiative. There, there's a, a local coordinator in each of um, the the, the 10 island territories, plus, plus French Guiana and, and Saint Pierre Miquelon. And uh, it, th this network, which is a global network, comprises one, more than 100 French overseas and, and French metropolitan experts. Uh, by experts, uh, I mean uh, uh, not only research scientists, but, but resource managers, NGOs, uh, and also representative of the local government authorities. And we, we, we met um, uh, in, in the different ocean for, for for workshop to, to share uh, our, our experiences on invasive species knowledge and management. We, we produced, uh, let's say, several, several documents, especially technical books and, and booklets and guidelines for, for those territories, we, and, and define some, some management techniques and protocols. Uh, also, sorry, we, we published also a few scientific papers but, but many popular papers in, in journals, in, in popular journals, uh, of course, in French languages. Uh, another very important action for us is try to, to promote or to do some, some lobbying at the national, the, the regional, the European, and, and sometimes at the international uh, uh, level. It's to try to, to integrate or to put the French overseas territory in, 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 the, in the, the agenda at, at different levels. That, that was very important. So, so, so we met in, in, in France, working on the national strategy on invasive species, but also at different uh, scientific uh, conferences, such as uh, this one. What we have done, it's also collecting and sharing data. By data, I mean uh, first-hand data ground collected data which were verified by the experts. And this data was put into a, a website and, and, and the, 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 the data was also transferred or integrated into more global or regional websites, the former Global Invasive Species data, Database and the current uh, Global Register of uh, Invasive Species. I cannot talk about invasive plant with, without mentioning Myconia, so it's, it's my case study. So it's maybe my, my hundred talk on Myconia, but you have to know about Myconia. It's, it's, a, sm it's a small tree uh, na native from, from South America. 
which was introduced uh, to first to Europe and then to, to, to some tropical islands, including Tahiti, and then it was dispersed to Hawaii, and it's also invasive in New Caledonia and Australia. Myconia is a kind of, of charismatic species because we developed a lot of public awareness in all those invaded countries. We developed also strict biosecurity bio protocols and measures. Uh, Myconia is, is part of a um, uh, noxious weed uh, species list of Hawaii. It's part of a weed of national significance in Australia and, uh, and considered legally as a threat to biodiversity in French Polynesia. We, we also developed tools uh, to predict the, 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 the potential impacts and distribution of myconia. So, so we developed distribution models and maps, uh, especially for decision makers. And this was very important in New Caledonia because we, we proposed to the New Caledonian authorities a, a, a predicted map of myconia if nothing is being done. And because we, we, we set up those maps, the New Caledonian authorities decided to, to start uh, eradication or control projects. And this was done in New Caledonia, in French Polynesia, in Hawaii, and in, in Australia. A, a very important and interesting result is, is uh, early detection and, and control of myconia in some islands where it was recently found. Uh, I, I, I show you the example of Martinique. Myconia was known in the, the Martinique uh, 15 years ago, but, but the, the population was rechecked recently in, in 2017, you can see there, there, were plant, there, there were individuals planted in botanical garden. And after rapid assessment, rapid expertise, the local authorities decided to try to eradicate the species uh, uh, for the past two years. And, and for the record, uh, myconia was also found here in La Réunion Island 20 years ago in a, in a private garden. It was um, discovered by Joël Dupont, who is, who is here in, in this room, and it was eradicated 20 20 years ago. The other issue is trying to find, find the, the next invader. As you may know, uh, most of the invasive plant species have a, a very long uh, uh, lag phase uh, and between introduction and invasion. So, so this, this global this, this network was able to, to identify some species which are present in other territories not yet invasive, but with a high potential of, of invasion. I, I took the example of, of African tulip tree, Spatodea campanulata. It's highly invasive in, in, in Tahiti, but uh, still planted in, in many islands uh, worldwide, including the Canarias, but it's, uh, it was also planted here in La Réunion uh, and starting to spread. And, and with my colleague Christophe Laverne, we also published uh, uh, scientific papers about the risk which are caused by, by other, other invasive plants which are known in some islands and just present or cultivated in others. My conclusions. So thanks to, to this initiative, and, and we, we have tried to, to do a very collective effort with different stakeholders, try to, to build a network uh, of national and local experts to, to get a better capacity building, especially a local capacity building. We were, we were able to, to increase knowledge and update the, the assessment of invasive alien, alien species in each territory to increase the knowledge. We, we, we published tool, toolkits, guidelines of best practices uh, for, for better management. And, and thanks to this initiative, we, we inspire the local authorities to set up uh, IES, uh, invasive alien species committees and I, I, AES strategies in each of those territories. So today, sorry, today you have you have strategies in La Réunion, in French Polynesia, in, in New Caledonia, in Mayotte. But of course, uh, uh, what is missing, maybe missing, is, is, is maybe more co regional, co more collaboration in the region between the, those French territories and, and, and non-French other territories in the same regions. And this kind of initiative may, may inspire other, other initiatives for foreign overseas territories we don't have that kind of network initiative for, for, um, for some threatened plants or ecosystem services. And, and I think the, the initiative has had a lot of success, so it could be a replicate in other fields of, of science. So thank you very much, Marjou Joa, and I'd like, of course, to thank my, my collaborators, Johan, uh, César, and Christophe, and to thank also uh, uh, 
of course, Dominique Strasberg, Claudine Aping, and Olivier Flores for having invited me and funding my trip to, to La Réunion. Thank you very much. Here's one. <laughs> Hello, um, down here. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, at the end, you mentioned the um, African tulip tree. Um, so is it uh, a problematic invasive species? And I asked before, in um, Puerto Rico and in the Caribbean, there's been studies where is, uh, this invasive species actually facilitates uh, the recruitment of native ones in new patches. Yeah, it's, a, it's one of the most invasive uh, tree species in the Pacific, uh, not only in French Polynesia, but also in Fiji or Hawaiian Islands. And, but the impact well, well, was not studied yet uh, in, in our territories, but maybe you have more data in Puerto Rico. Well, it's, as you know, it's a fast-growing pioneer species, uh, low to mid-elevation, uh, and, and its expansion is, is very, as you may know, very uh, linked to, to disturbance. Yes, so just, just you know, in, in Puerto Rico, it's also linked to disturbances. And in some places, um, so we used to have a, an economy based on agriculture, and now it, it changed um, recently in the 50s. And so these abandoned uh, grasslands, um, the African tulip, tulip tree invades, and then it facilitates the recruitment of um, native species. And um, someone that publishes a lot on that is Ariel Lugo from uh, Puerto Rico, so it might be helpful um, for research and conservation purposes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. There is one more question there. Well, many thanks, John Yves, for giving this nice overview of the advantages of networks. Um, and the example of uh, Spatodia, of the African tulip tree, quite clearly shows how important it is to exchange knowledge from different parts of the world. And this uh, relates also to another sector which has been rarely mentioned up to now, that's the horticultural sector and the uh, city administrations, uh, uh, national administrations for importing ornamentals. And uh, I think the uh, thing which still is happening, we saw slides the other day, is that uh, unintentionally and unknowledge, unknown, uh, many invasives are still brought in and um, your example shows that it is important to reach out to all of these target groups, but at the same time, I think we should try to invite more people from these uh, decision-making organizations to uh, just get our view of the effects uh, and to change the appearance, uh, the, the perception, nice plant, versus, well, probably not so nice plant. Yeah, I totally agree, Michael. But there's a lot of efforts being currently done by, by, by botanical gardens worldwide. I think now they have guidelines and, and to try not to introduce potential invasive species uh, or invasive species. So yeah, we have to, to work with, with all sectors. Uh, I mean, the, including the private sector and the botanical garden, the public and private botanical gardens. Any other question? If not, I have myself one question, Yanif, and maybe also for Helen. I was wondering in your cases that um, you are working with so many mm, very far away territories, uh, sometimes belonging to um, different ocean and administration. Um, what are the difficulties that are you finding uh, in order to networking? Well, in, in our case, it's, it's distance. I mean, it's, it costs a lot to, to, to organize those workshops, maybe, maybe through, through virtual conferences and, and, and other new technological tools, it will decrease the cost. Um, it's, it's good to meet with people, and, and that's why I'm here today. Um, you're doing everything through internet or email, it's maybe not as efficient than eye-to-eye -eye contact and sharing experience. 
uh, by people. Uh, what is difficult also in, in, the, in the French Polynesian overseas territories, as you, you may know, we've got uh, outermost countries, the department, which are French-French, with a French legislation and European legislation, and we've got territories such as New Caledonia or French Polynesia with our own legislation, which is sometimes uh, very useful because we, we don't need to, to follow uh, European rules, <laughs> which are perhaps sometimes constraining, but it might be complicated. In, in the case of New Caledonia, you've got three levels of governance. You've got the province, and they have their own legislation, and, and sometimes the leg legislation is different in the three provinces in terms of environment belonging to the, to the same territory. So we've got legislation issues and, and of course, budget issues. So I would um, just add to that, and that was a fantastic talk. You have done so much, it's amazing um, to see. So thank you very much for your talk. But in terms of um, the challenges, I'm relatively new in terms of working within the UK overseas territories, but so there's been some fantastic work um, that has gone before with, for example, um, funding, Darwin funding. But I think it's really critical that we ensure that there are adequate resources for um, these overseas territories because I think that networking connection and as you said that face-to-face -face connection is extremely important and you know some of these territories the the internet connection for example is is really not sufficiently robust to be able to do things um, remotely um, on a regular basis so actually meeting with one another is extremely important and ensuring that there are resources to do that um, but also I think not only in terms of um, knowledge sharing um, from, for example, the UK to the UK of these territories, but in the other way as well. You know, just visiting these places and running these um, workshops across all of the overseas territories, we as the kind of international experts visiting um, learned so, so much. And also I think that there's the opportunities within the territories for immediate action. So, for example, within the British Indian Ocean Territory, um, we had the people there from the Environment Department who took the list away and it was immediately embedded within the Conservation Action Plan because they had been part of the whole process that led to that prioritization. So they saw the rigor and the, the robust nature about how we went through it. That's kind of immediate action that we wouldn't necessarily get um, in um, other places. But similarly, for example, in St. Helena, seeing the amazing biosecurity, but also seeing, for example, the action in terms of restoration, clearing New Zealand flax and restoring um, natural habitats. It's, it, we have so much to learn in terms of what can be done. And that allows me to mention that um, Lawrence is leading a workshop um, on Thursday around um, restoration of fragmented habitats. So you'd all be extremely welcome to attend. Um. Thank you very much, Janif, for your interesting talk. <laughs> okay, me again. It's, it's a real duo. It's a duo with gender equity, so it's, it's very good. So the next speaker, sorry, Cedric. No, David. Oui, not Cédric. Next speaker is David uh, Ringler. So he works for the, the TAF, uh, the Terra Australia Antarctic Française, the French Southern and Antarctic Lands. Okay, thank you. Good morning to you all. Um, so, yes, I'm working on another French overseas territory, which probably you may not know because we didn't do uh, many communication on this territory. So I will uh, do have... Um, um, a short introduction on invasive species management in this territory, which is called French Southern and Antarctic Lands, Terre Australe et Antarctique Française in, um, in French. So what is French Southern and Antarctic Lands? Um, it's a collection of over uh, 300 islands and islets, uh, ranging from less than one hectare to 7,000 square kilometers, which is Kerguelen. And which is very unique for, uh, for a French territory is also that um, all these islands are uh, distributed um, along almost 80% of the southern hemisphere, from tropics to Antarctic. So you have different groups of islands uh, with Ilse Pars, Pars Islands in the tropical part of the territory. You have uh, Amsterdam group in the subtropical uh, environment, and you have Crozet, Kerguelen uh, in the Sub-Antarctic uh, part of the, of the territory. And we also manage 
a part of the Antarctica with Terra Deli. Uh, which is also unique is that all the islands are uh, considered as nature reserved and um, us, French Southern and Antarctic land staff, are managing this, uh, this islands. Um, there's no permanent population on this island, but human presence with scientific bases and uh, also field staff working for the nature reserves. And which is remarkable uh, is that um, this collection of islands are uh, truly uh, hotspot biodiversity. And the figure we use uh, every time to present that is that we host almost 50 million seabirds on our territory. So that's a huge biomass of seabirds. Of course, we are here to talk about introduced species. So like almost like pretty much all the, the islands in the world, uh, species uh, have been introduced on the territory. And this occurred from the 17th century, uh, when the first settlers uh, came to this islands. And, um, and, whoa, are you okay? And from 17th century to, to the late 80s, uh, we have a lot of introduction, a lot of um, uh, mammals and plant introduction. So you have the figures here from the different groups uh, of, uh, of islands, uh, where you have uh, pretty much like 50 to 100 plant introduction on each group of islands. And um, not many uh, invasive mammals uh, introduced on these islands, but we are the most probably the most invasive species we, are, we can find uh, all over the world. So we have mice, cats, rats on these islands. So the first work we had to do uh, with that is, uh, was to, to, to perform some impact studies starting in the 80s, because uh, we have to, to show, to observe what was the invasiveness uh, degree and the severity of the impacts on biodiversity, on native biodiversity. And uh, also in terms of management, uh, it, um, it permitted to, to make priorities to, for early management measures. So as you can imagine, we found a lot of impacts on native BRT, uh, a lot of direct impacts. I'm gonna just present some of them, uh, illustrated by some uh, evident cases. Uh, the first one is, uh, is browsing. Browsing by herbivores on, uh, on this island is a massive uh, issue. Uh, I illustrated this by the um, disappearance of, uh, of the unique uh, native tree we had on, uh, on Amsterdam, the Filica arborea, uh, which was massively uh, predated by, uh, by feral cattle uh, during a century. So the map you have on the right was the original distribution of, the, of, this, uh, of this tree. And uh, a century later, you can see that uh, there's pretty much like 95 or 99 percent of the population that have disappeared. So that was a huge issue. And we have uh, a lot more issue with browsing. Competition is also another mechanism uh, appearing in, the, in all the islands. Um, I illustrated that with the case of, um, of uh, also another endemic species of uh, Kerguelen archipelago, which is a uh, Kerguelen cabbage, uh, who disappeared massively from all the offshore islands of Kerguelen and was uh, replaced by uh, the dandelion. So we have massive uh, transformation of landscape, uh, ranging from what you see on the left from what you see now uh, on the right. Uh, this was also um, helped this mechanism with the combination of other pressures like browsing with rabbits uh, predating on, on, on cacao and cabbage and also climate change because what we can see now on uh, the southern territories is that um, temperature is increasing and rainfall is largely decreasing and it, um, it permits some, some expansion of the dandelion. And of course, predation, which is uh, uh, um, probably the most severe impact we, we observed on, uh, on our islands, um, with predators impacting pretty much all the native preys, like seabirds, like land birds, reptiles, invertebrates. Most of the study have been uh, led and working on, uh, on seabirds, um, on, Im on impact of predators on seabirds, so we have plenty of studies. I will just illustrate that uh, with a uh, with, uh, few examples. 
and which is worse is the combination of multiple um, invasive species, which can increase the potential of, uh, of predation on, um, on seabirds. So for the case of, um, uh, of an invasional meltdown with multi-invaded uh, ecosystems where um, some, uh, some introduced prey uh, can sustain uh, a, an invasive predator during the period where, for example, you have no seabird on the islands, and then uh, in return, you have the, the invasive predator who can uh, prey massively on, uh, on invasive prey, on native prey. So let's see a few examples from tropical islands and from subarctic islands. Um, we have massive decline of seabirds on pretty much all the islands uh, around the territory. So you have the case on Juan de Nova, where we had, maybe 20 years ago, one of the largest colony of sooty terns with pretty much like two million pairs. And 20 years ago, we had only um, uh, four, 400,000, so a decrease of uh, maybe four times of uh, the, um, the population of, uh, of the breeding birds. And all of this was, um, we found that all of this was, um, was led by the predation of, um, uh, by, by feral cats and uh, also by introduced uh, rats. We have also the case on Europa Island where we have massive decline of uh, some, uh, some native uh, seabirds some tropic birds. We have also an endemic subspecies of tropic birds on Europa, and both species are, uh, are massively decreasing, uh, and that's what we observed during the last 20 years, uh, with half of the population that have disappeared on this, uh, on this island. And some example also on, on Croze, which is a subarctic island, where we work on, uh, on white chin petrels and impact of rats on white chin petrels, and uh, we also see that they had a major impact on predict success. So all of this, um, all of this is not a good sign because we don't have any uh, any population with invasive predator on the same island that um, are in a in a good health now. And another impact, which we talk about uh, a bit uh, uh, before, is diseases, pathogens. Um, that's a new issue uh, we have now uh, in, uh, in, in our, on our islands. And um, I can illustrate that with the case of Amsterdam Island, where we found uh, a few years ago uh, that a new bacteria has been introduced to the island and threatening um, albatrosis community and uh, affecting breeding success with a lot of, uh, of chicks dying because of this uh, bacteria. And, um, the problem is that it's affecting seabirds that nesting just in this area, albatross present there. And right here in the altitude, you have the Al Amsterdam albatross, which is one of the rarest seabirds in the world where we have only 40, 40 pairs. And what we suspect is that the, the, the disease uh, will be transmitted to the, um, to the Amsterdam albatross using this kind of friend which is a rat that can potentially act as a reservoir of, uh, of the bacteria. And some other colleagues here uh, with seabirds, with other seabird species, with squaw that can transmit from, the, from here to there. So that's our just, um, that's a real uh, big issue now for the Amsterdam albatross. What we do also, uh, completing impact studies, um, we also uh, perform some survey to inform, information, uh, to inform operational planning. Um, the main goal of this is to ensure the success of operation, of eradication or control operation. And um, it's been maybe 10 years that we, what we, perform, that we perform this kind of, uh, of, of study. It's the uh, know your enemy part, uh, where we work on population dynamics of invasive uh, species on um, interaction with uh, other introduced species uh, with uh, trophic and behavioral uh, ecology to avoid super surprise effects when we, when we suppress uh, an invasive species from the environment. And also we perform some field, uh, field trials, uh, including non-tardic uh, species uh, tests to minimize collateral damage. So uh, now is the time for management strategy. We, um, we have seen that many impacts, uh, many, many species impacts uh, native biodiversity. So the first step was to implement some biosecurity strategy uh, on the territory. 
uh, that has been um, put in place maybe 10 or 15 years ago now, um, first to reduce the risk of new invasion, and, uh, and, and secondly to permanently guarantee the risk of post-eradication re-invasion, because the TAF are, uh, are, are performing a, a lot of, um, of eradication and control programs now, which is what I present here. Um, it's a second step of our management strategy. Uh, we have uh, some control programs and eradication programs, mainly targeting plants and invasive mammals. Uh, we have nothing concerning vertebrates for the moment. And the idea here is to manage, manage the invasive population when it's financially and technically feasible. We are working at the French scale, and um, right now, um, uh, human resource and financial resources are, are pretty scarce to, to, to work on that. So we work only on, on, on small populations, some small, small islands, and uh, had, um, uh, had to scale up uh, at one moment. So we worked on, uh, on 14 mammal eradication, all successful. We have one ongoing control program uh, targeting feral cat on Kerguelen, and we also had uh, 14 plant eradication. Uh, and more than on 80 ongoing operation, mainly control operation to, uh, to, to maintain, to, to contain some, uh, some, some wheat population on, um, on, on, on small surfaces. So there is a case study of the invasive mammal eradication where we targeted seven species and starting in 1992 uh, with the first successful eradication targeting rabbits on Kerguelen. And when we started doing some eradication in routine, of course, we had also failures uh, appearing, uh, mostly regarding mice and cats. Uh, all the operation that concerned uh, mice were, were unsuccessful, and we had problems with cats uh, with reversion issue. Also, largest eradication uh, of, uh, of rats uh, was performed in 2004 uh, with an island uh, close to 20 square kilometers. And largest feral cat eradication happened just two years ago on Jean de Nova with an island of, um, of around uh, 500 hectares. So what, what, that was the, the achievement um, in terms of in invasive mammal eradication uh, along the territory. And of course, all of this, we, we had to, um, to measure all the ecologic impacts uh, with, uh, with pre-study, monitoring pre-study and monitoring uh, native population right after the operation. So I'll just briefly present the case of uh, Tromelin Island. Uh, Mathieu Lecor will have a, a talk Friday on that and, and give you details of that. But just less than 10 years after the rat eradication that happened in 2005, uh, we had uh, a massive changes on the ecosystem with the only two uh, seabird population that were there that increased uh, a lot. And uh, there was just an explosion of the population and, uh, and, uh, and five new species uh, colonized the island right after the eradication. So that was massive. And we had cascading effects with that uh, because these inputs of, uh, of, uh, of marine uh, nutrients from the seabirds also changed profoundly all the, all the landscape. That was what I, I told you about uh, a, a few slides uh, back. It's time now for, uh, for scaling up. It's, um, it's a global trend. Uh, largely in the world, everyone wants to scale up with invasive species management. So what we want to do on TAF is to, to target more islands, to have a large sketch effort, uh, to, to conserve more, uh, more species and also more um, part of the population. Currently we have only restored uh, 90 square kilometers and I told you the territory is is larger than 7,000 square kilometers, so we have only treated 1% of the territory, so we need to target more, more islands. Target also more species, because we are mainly now focused on some plants and some rodents or feral cat eradication. We'd like to, to, to work on, on more species and, uh, and, uh, and maybe um, invertebrates. Also work with complex habitat. Uh, one example I use every time is is treating the case of, um, of, uh, of rodent eradication in uh, habitat like mangroves, 
for the moment, uh, working on mangroves over 500 hectares is pretty much impossible. So we need to uh, address uh, this kind of issue uh, of uh, eradicating species from complex habitat. And also the problem with large islands, what we can do with the mainland Kerguelen, which is over 7,000 kilometers square. And for that, we launched a program uh, this year that will help us, I think, to scale up to, to fight against uh, uh, invasive species. The program is called Restoring Indian Ocean Insular Ecosystem, which is funded by European Union. And the objective with this program is to strengthen um, first our uh, own human resource, because they are pretty much uh, very scarce uh, at, the, at this time currently, and uh, also strengthen operational skills. So developing also uh, some networks of technical and scientific collaborations, and uh, sustain some investment solicitation. So if we want to perform some eradication on more and more islands and larger and larger islands, we will need some, uh, some investment from public and, and, and private uh, organization. And finally, the operational uh, objective is to uh, make priorities of operation and conduct in routine uh, eradication on all over the ter territory from tropics to, to sub-Antarctic and strengthen the, the global security strategy because um, that's the most cost-effective um, uh, strategy to, 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 to avoid a new, new issue with invasive species. So that's it for me. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Hello, um, I'm Lawrence. Uh, what happened to your Phylica arborea um, after 88? So now we have a, a restoration program with Phylica arborea, which has been launched uh, maybe t almost 10 years ago. So we have replanted more than 20,000 uh, Phylica on, uh, on the ground. And now we have maybe, I don't know, like 20 hectares more of Phylica arborea which is only maybe two or three percent of the original distribution of the Filica in Amsterdam. Thank you very much. So we, we move on to, to Marta. Uh, it's a great pleasure also for me to, to welcome you, Marta. Uh, well, we never met. We, we just met yesterday. We, we had to, to set up this symposium together a couple of weeks ago, but we, we met just yesterday, and uh, I think... Uh, was nice to meet you, Marta. The Very same. <laughs> so you've got 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oops, sorry, Marta works for a Spanish National Research Council uh, at the Canary Islands. Hola. Thanks. Thanks, Yanif. I will try to run a little bit because we are a little bit out of time. Uh, but before starting, I will thank especially Julien and Pablo that are here and other colleagues from the Macaronesian, within which I won't, be, I won't have been able to prepare this talk for you today. So I'm going to share with you an overview of past, present, and future of invasive alien species management in the Macaronesian island. For those of you who are not familiar with the Macaronesian, this is a set of four archipelagos um, located in the North Atlantic Ocean, from north to south, um, the Azores, Madeira, the Canary Islands, and a fourth one in the southernmost part of the biogeographical region, which is Cape Bird, but sorry that for this purpose, sorry Raquel, I was not able to include it uh, because uh, of logistic reasons and difficulties to contact uh, researchers there and managers. So this is a biogeographical region that uh, host an exceptional biodiversity within Europe. Uh, of course, there are a lot of endemisms, uh, as you have all also said for other islands, that um, live in a great variety of microclimates. We know pretty well the number of uh, species that um, live in the Macaronesia, 
And just to, for you to know, we um, host more than 3,500 endemics among the, these three archipelagos. But also, as uh, other colleagues have already mentioned, there are a lot of, endem of invasive species in these islands. For example, in the Azores, uh, the number of exotic plants and exotic arthropods are of, uh, almost 60% uh, of the total flora. So when we start this uh, overview with, with this, uh, this review, uh, we wanted to set the baseline of what we have done so far in these islands, as any of the islands have a regional strategy on invasive alien species, uh, not even any planned action. So for doing so, we use the, the European strategy on invasive alien species, the structure that um, Piero Genovesi and uh, Claire Schein use for this document as uh, an structure for our review. So right now, I'm gonna present uh, by blocks uh, what we have done so far in the Macaronesia. So regarding building awareness and support, we have reviewed um, all the mention that we have or the, the inclusion that we have of invasive alien species in formal and non-formal um, education and also what we have done so far in social participation. It's very um, uh, noticeable to find that there is no any subject or mention mandatory in the non-university um, educational level in any of the archipelagos, not in Portugal legislation in education and neither in the Spanish one, which are the countries to which these um, archipelagos belong. And only in the Canary Island, I, I was able to find a learning situation that is not mandatory for teachers, but they can use it voluntarily to sp speak about invasive species to a student that is related with the invasive uh, Californian kin snake in Gran Canaria. If you want to know more about this uh, team, uh, you, uh, this area, Julian will give a talk on Thursday. And what is even more surprising is that when we uh, review um, the subjects regarding invasive alien species at a university level, uh, only one of the four public university in the archipelago, which is the University of La Laguna, has a subject specifically designed to treat invasive alien species. And it's not in the grade of biology, it's in the grade of environmental science. And then later on, in a more um, high level education, uh, the University of La Laguna has also two subjects uh, in two different masters. In the area of the non-formal education, we have done a lot of uh, punctual and independent actions all over the archipelagos, but any except for, mm, and uh, we have to use, um, how do you say this? Uh, quotation, <laughs> except for in the Canary Islands, uh, are um, within the, the umbrella of a uh, regional strategy. So the Canary Islands have uh, approved recently a strategy on environmental education that has been followed by a plan on environmental education of, uh, of only one of the seven islands, which is Tenerife, with its own plan. And within this, um, in the last two years, there have been several educational campaigns uh, directed to different actors. A school, uh, primary school, um, security bodies, and also municipalities, mainly. And regarding social participation, as well, there are a lot of social, action, uh, social participation actions, uh, but normally uh, link to the um, execution of a project, and once that project is ended, all those actions ended up as well. Except for a social participation that is occurring in Tenerife, and that I think it's the most interesting uh, uh, social participation program in the Macaronesia, which is regarding this species, uh, an invasive species priority for the European, European Union, which is the Penicetum cetaceum. And uh, for which 
a couple of very committed, com committed uh, people um, located in this high biodiversity area in the island of Tenerife, which is the rural park of Tenu, has been developing monthly actions through a sponsorship um, to control these species in the park. Right now, we can say that uh, social participation has controlled these species in the park, and that won't, be, won't have been possible without social involvement. So regarding what we have done so far in collecting margin and sharing information, the three archipelagos have a list of uh, species uh, only um, available online in the case of the Azores and the Canary Islands, where everybody can check the list of species and also the distribution uh, maps. And regarding science uh, research and monitoring, we are showing here only the, the results from the Canary Islands. I promise to keep working on, on data of the other archipelagos. And um, the publications in the Canary Islands uh, regarding invasive species are around 350. Uh, most of them have been published in the last uh, decade. Um, plants are the ones that have more publications, followed by mammals. And regarding the, the aim of the publication, most of them, however, are just to say we have a new invasive species in the islands, followed by 20, almost 21% of um, um, publications related to in, in invasive species um, impacts, and then 11% of uh, invasive species management. And with respect of regional exchange of information, we should say we are lucky because there is a, a specific program in the European U Union designed to improve networking in the Macaronesia, which is the Interreg, especially the Interreg Mac. And there you can see the projects that have been related to invasive alien species to create networking. However, this networking ends up once the project ends up and remain only a link to personal um, relationship between people. Regarding legal framework, as we are uh, European archipelagos, of course, the regulation, the European regulation um, is also for us. But um, this regulation obliges all the state members with outermost regions to have uh, published a list of the priority species, invasive species of each uh, region before um, 2017. No, two 2017, yes. Uh, and the Canary Island is the one, the only one that has uh, published it and hit it with two years of delay. The others, we there still have to do it. And then at the national and regional level, there are, the law is really scarce. Regarding prevention, early detention, detection and rapid responses, only, I was only able to find some risk analysis um, um, work for the Canary Islands, uh, representing a couple of analyses for vertebrates, uh, only for six species of invertebrates and 42 species, plant species. And um, only in the Canary Islands, we have recently started a pilot exp experience on a rapid detection network, which is called Red Exos, um, and it just started a year ago. So the government has started that with the um, um, link to every island council, and also with our research center uh, advice, scientific advice, his plan is the public enterprise who execute the plan, and Red Exos has also um, implement an application, an app, uh, an app that would be linked uh, to the um, list of species, the online list of species of the Canary Islands. In the block of mitigation actions is where we have done the most. And I'm going to show uh, the results 
for each archipelago. In the case of the Azores, there has been uh, 10 projects uh, that regarding invasive alien species or that have actions regarding invasive species, but only 20% of those have been the vote only uh, to invasive species. Uh, from those, I want to um, point out uh, particularly Prefecias, which was a project that started in, two th in 2003 and which uh, um, promotes the removal of 27 invasive uh, plant species in more than 300 hectares in the Azores. And also I want to point out uh, the um, recent uh, start of this project that although it is not only for um, invasive alien species management, there has a lot of, act of actions regarding this, this um, problem. And uh, Paulo can talk about um, this more later if you want, but that will um, set the baseline of many missing and lacking points in the Azores regarding invasive alien species management. In the case of, the, of Madeira, there has been 14 projects since 1990 with a total budget of 500, uh, 5 million euros and 43% uh, of them are directly devoted to invasive alien species. From those, I wanted to point out particularly uh, the elimination of all that amount of goats from Madeira and Porto Santo in 1994 also in 1996, the eradication from, of goats, cats, and rabbits uh, from Deserta and Deserta Grande. Uh, also in 2001, the eradication of mites and rabbits from Salvayam Grande. And along all this period, in different projects, um, the treatment and control of a lot of invasive plant species that has been removed for many locations of the principal island of Madeira. And in the case of the Canary Islands, here is where we, ha we have been more lucky getting projects, uh, a lot of 47, with 77% uh, of them and a budget of over uh, almost uh, 20 million euros uh, devoted only to invasive alien species. And from these, um, I wanted to point out the eradication of rabbits from Montaña Clara, uh, which is uh, still nowadays the island in which rabbit uh, has been, the, the biggest islands in the world where rabbits have been eradicated only by mechanical means. As well, the Canary Islands has been all the only uh, place in the world where the palm weevil has been eradicated, and it was a project that lasted for six, six years and ended up in 2012. And recently, the island of Tenerife, which is the one that is uh, promoting more the, the, um, the invasive species management, has started a plan for the eradication of, of invasive plants in the island. They are uh, removing 48 species of uh, invasive plants um, in a total up to date of almost 400 hectares. So with that and also having in mind was what other colleagues have said of other archipelagos, with, I think particularly this is something that I have not discussed with my colleagues, but I particularly think that being uh, so close, being so um, important in biodiversity in Europe, belonging only to two different countries, we should really work hard in the Canary Islands, Madeira and the Azores to manage invasive alien species and try to have as soon as possible an invasive strategy at the regional level and also pl action plans. And reviewing what we have done, as Michael said at, at the beginning, in that list of the guide, um, if we go and tick what we have to do, we have almost have to do all what the guy is saying because there is still much uh, to be done. And especially we have to work in the foundation, we have to set an appropriate foundation uh, to um, be able to plan and make decision uh, with more 
foundation and also generating support, which is very lacking in this island, and building capacity of, and of course, work much harder on legislation, and also in, on implementing the legislation that we already have, that is not implemented. As well in the blog of the Guide of Information and Prioritization, uh, we have to say, and I hope this will be um, such a work, the baseline of what we have done so far, uh, and also we have to do a lot of effort on prioritization, which we are not doing, uh, and also try to focus our research on priorities. And with regards of manage management actions, uh, we have done many things on controlling and eradicating a species, but the three archipelagos nowadays are totally open to what the, uh, everybody wants to bring from the exterior because any of them have a biosecurity system uh, already implemented. And as well, we have to do a lot of, on restoration. And to finish, and something that uh, other colleagues ha has already, have already mentioned, we have to work together as the only way to make the most of the available resources. Thank you very much. Only to say that uh, most of the work in this archipelago have been done with uh, plants and uh, birds. Um, but now, we, at least in the Azores, the government wants to invest also in the uh, invertebrates. And we got uh, last week a, a life project approved for uh, conserving invertebrates and uh, related with removing invasive species to conserve invertebrates. That far is uh, something new in the Azores at least. And also the government approved within that uh, big life as uh, the finally to build the plan, invasive species plan for uh, Azores and have the list. Therefore, probably in two years time, we will have the, that things done. Great, Paulo, thanks. Another question? Burning issue? <laughs> nope. Okay. Well, on behalf of, of Martin and myself, uh, I would like to, to thank uh, first the, the, the speakers who, who played the game, and I would like also to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, and thank you for the speakers. Thank you. Okay, great.